All right. So hello and welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining in today, tonight, uh, if you're over here in Australia and, and obviously morning in uh, uh, the UK. And if you're joining us from overseas in North America as well, it'll be like, when would it be? Actually, no, 9 a.m. Thursday morning and mid-afternoon in Europe. Let me get my time zones right. So I um, want to welcome you to the Keen Folks Bridge the Digital Gap uh, edition 2021. And uh, my name is Doyle Bueller, and I'll get into some introductions coming up. But today we want to talk about it's obviously part of the uh, automation and AI adoption. But what do we need to discuss and what do we need to adopt in 2022? So we've seen sort of a surge in AI and, and our experts here will really be able to kind of key us in and answer some of those key questions as we get into this. Um, but we want to see kind of how the, the businesses are evolving and how we're using AI and you know, can we use it differently and what's so important about it and why do businesses kind of really need to grasp onto it? And even if you're not fully into it, even if you're just kind of starting, we'd kind of really love to get some uh, feedback and questions as well in terms of what do we need to do to get started and and what's really important? How can we look at this uh, in, in that vein as well in terms of how do we make it work for business as well around the world? So um, I'm joined today rather with uh, Tony Bouvier and Tim Kortinovis, and we also had David Vivanikas. Hopefully, he'll be able to join us later. Um, we don't, we're not sure if he's having a connection problem, but if he can't join us, that's fine. But if he does, uh, we might see him pop in as well, and we'll get him to answer some of the questions as well. So, love to hear a quick little introduction from uh, both of you, Tony and Tim. Tony, would you like to start? Yeah, sure. So, uh, my name is Tony Bubier. I'm, I'm based just outside London. Uh, I started life as an engineer but somehow found my way into the financial services industry where I spent a couple of decades there. Um, I became more and more interested in the whole topic of data and analytics. And you know, rather than have people tell me what it was all about, I wanted to learn for myself. So I stepped out of my comfort zone into the tech sector, uh, moved into the world of data and analytics where I spent two decades there, uh, ending up as a worldwide exec for one of the large tech companies. Um, I retired formally from, from there in 2016 to become an independent advisor. I do advisory board mentoring and I really enjoy writing books. I've written three so far on the topic of AI and a fourth one coming out uh, this coming summer, uh, which is probably enough for anybody really. But uh, as you'll see from behind me, I just love books. Just love books. That's good. Love it. Yeah. I'm. Um former engineer as well, Tony, and a book writer and a book reader. You can't see them, but they're they're down in the corner. So um, welcome and happy to have you here joining us in the conversation. Uh, Tim, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you, Doyle, uh, of course. Yeah, um, good afternoon. I'm uh, talking to you from Hamburg in Germany, in the northern part of Germany where I'm based. And yes, uh, ever since I was a small boy at the age of about 16, I am... Um, into the topic of AI and the usage of AI in our daily lives. I uh, yes, uh, with sixteen, I in, um, I program a first computer with a, a small version of Eliza, and uh, that was nothing in comparison to what we have today. But ever since, uh, my idea was how could we leverage AI in the daily business tasks? And I then entered some twenty years ago in the field of B two B sales. And I ever wondered, uh, how can I do these daily tasks better and more efficient using AI? And uh, with this, uh, since 2011, I'm now a global consultant and a speaker on that topic. And I advise companies on using AI in their sales automations, sales processes, and uh, the, outcomes are, the outcome are happy sales teams with... Uh, with um, with a lot of more happy customers. Nice, perfect. Well done. So sales is a huge part of what we're doing in business, right? So if, <laughs> can we can we get like an AI person that sells for us yet, Tim? <laughs> yes, I think so. Yes. Um, okay. <laughs> A few, just a few companies are, um, are achieving this, but uh, yeah, theoretically, it's, it's possible right now. Nice, because because if they can handle sales, if I can give it to my AI bots or whatever AI, yeah, that's I think the idea. Save a lot of businesses. <laughs> yes, and we're talking about millennials, and they're uh, less into um, into the sales part ever. 
And so, yes, we have to search for, for ways to do sales without us as humans. Excellent. So we got some cool ideas to talk about as well around that area. So thanks, Tim, for the introduction. David, welcome. Um, thanks for joining in. <laughs> Hope uh, obviously you got um, uh, fixed some of the tech issues or whatever the case may be, but uh, welcome. And we're just doing introduction. So if you want to quickly tell us about yourself and then we'll continue on. Yeah, thank you very much, Doyle. It's great to be here with all of you. Yes, I think uh, my my journey is more or less about 27 years trying to create companies at the edge of some people think uh, things that are impossible and basically trying to overcome them. I have created companies from a few of the first internet companies, have created nanotechnology companies, space companies, and lately over the last maybe 12 years or so, AI companies and, and brain science companies over the last times. And I'm also author of a couple of books and I'm also advisor to several companies from big corporations to great startups that are in the journey to becoming billion dollar brands like the Kimfox. Excellent. And, and, do you, and so where are you based, David? You're well, I'm based in, in San Lorenzo Les Corrales, a north uh, UNESCO site city in the north of Madrid, in Spain. Okay, excellent. All right, uh, good. And, and you're involved with King Folks directly, then? Is that is that correct? Yeah, yeah I'm a board member, and I'm also helping them in well creating this data driving company and helping them foster all the capabilities of automation at, at the core. Excellent. All right, cool. So we've got sales, we've got automation. Tony, what was your specialty again with AI? Oh. Um... Jack of all trades, really. Jack um, of all trades. You know, I think I, I think I see. In fact, I know I see the advantage of advanced analytics and AI pretty well mm. on an enterprise-wide level. So, Perfect. you know, I see it in terms of risk, uh, customer yeah. operational efficiency, and and I can, I can really see application of AI to all those areas. Okay, good. So hopefully we'll get some some questions. So I just wanted to mention and throw it out there that if you have uh, questions, please ask them in the chat. Uh, now or as you go along and if you've got a question you want to ask uh, we'd love to hear from you um, you know tell us quickly where you're from if you're asking a question and then uh, the question and then we'll try to address it as, as soon as we can uh, as well so we want to kind of create create this as a discussion too we obviously have a few points that we want, we want to be able to cover um, but if anybody uh, uh, from the audience would love to ask a question or just kind of want to push us in another <laughs> direction please feel free to do so um, so thanks for the introductions uh, Tony, Tim, and David. Uh, my name is Doyle Bueller, as I mentioned. Um, I'm a digital strategist, so I take a look at the digital strategy uh, around businesses and see how we can make them better. I've been in business for about 20 years. I built uh, one of Canada's top 50 fastest growing companies, e-commerce companies uh, in Canada, the top 50, and the top fastest growing in, in um, uh, the province of Manitoba. And from there, I kind of expanded around the world, and that's how I wound up in Australia. <laughs> Um, where I, I was going from Winnipeg, Canada, which is minus 40 degrees in the wintertime, and they're just kind of getting out of the snow, uh, to Perth, Australia, where I'm I'm uh, calling from now, where it's like, it's not plus 40 today, but it was plus 40 in, in January, February. So it's a, a big change. I like the hot as opposed to the cold. So, um, and my interest in AI is really just kind of as a supporting, how do we actually utilize it for business strategy? Um, so making sure that it has you know, the connection points back to the business to say, how can we actually make this work uh, today? Like I try to kind of keep businesses within that that realm of possibilities, you know, one to two years type things, 500 and 1,000 day roadmaps. So how can we actually use AI uh, in those frameworks? It's kind of my, my specialty and where I'm kind of looking for uh, answers, you know, from this discussion as well. So, all right, so let's get rolling. Um, can we go to the first sets of questions and any, and again, if you, if, if anybody watching or listening in, please just ask a question, uh, when we get into it as well. So quickly, the, auto, the agenda that we're going to go through is how is automation changing businesses and how should we be tackling it? Uh, what does 2022 hold for AI and what are the top trends in AI that will mark the next five years? And then hopefully, like I said, have some Q and a uh, questions as well. So, um, let's get right into it. How is business automation changing businesses and how should you be tackling it? Who would like to take a stab at that one first? Oh, you can see we're keen, can't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> isn't it isn't it tea time in in, in London right now? <laughs> no, but it's nearly beer time. Uh, okay. I'll start off just to get the conversation going. Um, so uh, automation really is one of the the 
um, elements on the maturity curve of getting to a full AI environment. Um, and therefore, we're seeing an, an amazing trend towards RPA and you know, companies uh, in that particular space are becoming very busy, especially busy at the moment. Um, if you link in the whole RPA and automation story to uh, business requirements generally, we think in terms of there really being three key imperatives. The first one being um, focusing on the customer around acquisition and retention. The second is around operational efficiency. Uh, obviously taking cost out of the equation. And the third one is around risk management. So therefore, any repetitive process which falls within any of those three um, really lends itself to the opportunity for automation as part of the general journey towards AI. Um, I will throw in a, a wild card as well, and that's the issue of automation and AI in the public sector, which is something which has particularly taken my attention. Um, especially over the past two years of lockdown. Um, the public sector represent between 15 and 20% of employees globally. Uh, it's a major industry in its own right. And of course, the public sector is likely to be placed under very considerable pressure because of the money spent by governments in fighting the pandemic. So I actually see as my fourth wildcard um, how uh, automation and AI will find its way into the very complex uh, and very political uh, world of the public sector generally. But I think there's one more point uh, to add to me, if I'm, uh, if I'm allowed to do so. Um, in the public sector as well, we have uh, the, the, the need for uh, employees. Uh, we have a, a labor market that is um, very under pressure. We see it in sales and in business in general, but also in the public sector. They, in, um, for instance, in Germany, many public um, governmental uh, institutions have problems to find the right people, the smart people, and they need automation to uh, keep on uh, doing their um, their tasks. Yeah. Also, it's interesting that automation at the end in the public sector can also automate many of the, of, the, of the employees at the moment. So that's one of the areas to develop. And it also goes to one of the critical assets of why automation is fundamental is basically because for companies, for corporations and for the public sector too, it's fundamental to, uh, to leverage one of the main assets that sometimes is forgotten. And it's the time, the time itself, the time to really think beyond and the time to use it to go to the next step. And if you automate, you can save a lot of time and you can use that time to move forward. So we immediately have an issue here, don't we? That, you know, clearly many industries, maybe all industries are looking at AI and automation as being a possible solution to their new business models. But yet there is a, a shortage of appropriate talent in the marketplace. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and, and and you can't create that talent overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and also, in, in fact, the talent market is competitive. So therefore, the private sector, parts of the private sector are clearly at an advantage, such as banking, um, where they are able to pay uh, better salaries, offer better packages. And therefore, even though uh, what we might call second tier industries might want to get on the on the AI train but are, are we getting too far ahead of ourselves like if we're saying okay ai is is great and it's ch going to change your business and transform your business but yet we can't kind of really fulfill that are, are we kind of just trying are we too far ahead the, of the curve kind of thing the thing is that simultaneously we, we are having like some sort sort of of the self ai and that is easier to use and easier to manage because many companies like of course the big the big corporations, um, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, etc., they are already providing services where you don't need to have that kind of huge expertise in to try to implement all that. But of course, if you want to be at the edge, you need that data science, you need that kind of talent that is very scarce at the moment. And it is very huge market of basically they're trying to move between these companies. And that's the, the critical asset to really create innovative uh, things. But if you are just using of the self, it is growing fast every time and with the the also with the uh, emergence of the no code uh, systems where basically you can also start to do things without having to have like this deeper knowledge it's also game changer at the moment yes i see, I see so too and since uh, about uh, half a year ago uh, we're seeing the rise of uh, ai as a as a service and uh, the composable enterprise concept and so you can use, uh, even if you don't have the data scientists and all that talented people, and you can make usage of AI. And uh, I think the most important point is uh, to start small and then uh, doing agile steps 
um, to, um, to increase the usage of AI in your business. But you, you should start small and you don't have to build the cathedral in one day. You just should start with a small first step and then see the, the advantages and uh, your people are thriving for it and then going on and on and building it up from that point. But one of the challenges for me, though, gentlemen, is that the expression AI um, attracts quite a lot of hype insofar as that people all want to get on the AI bandwagon. Mm -hmm. They all want to have a capability which is AI driven, when in fact, perhaps we are not looking at anything more sophisticated than maybe uh, predictive analytics, advanced analytics, yeah. um, and some of the components like facial or voice recognition. Um, the many businessmen and many people in the street think that AI is something which um, is just a way of having decisions made for them in an artificial sort of way. You know, what shall I watch on TV? What, what shall I buy my, my wife or girlfriend on, on Amazon? And they view that as being uh, AI. The reality is that AI, in its purest sense, really is much more sophisticated than uh, your choice of TV on Netflix, for example. Mm -hmm. The thing is that you need so, to go to the beginning and the beginning basically is data and many companies they really are not capturing the data and data not captured is data lost so you want to start really create this uh, ai at the future and maybe automation why not you need to start with gathering that data the datification of the companies is something that is still in a very early age for many many for the small companies a lot and even for some media business and for some public sector too so if we don't have data we don't have anything we don't have analytics we don't have mm -hmm. ai and of course we won't be able also to take all the possibilities of trying to see what are the best things that we can automate by using ai or by using many other techniques that can help us to automate and you basically will be stuck in having not enough. And when you talk about data, you need to th th to think not only about the data that you produce, but also the data that is outside. There's a lot of open data that can enrich all of the things that you do, or what it's legal, maybe you can also buy data. So is there like a huge gap then between um, how we interpret what AI can do and the expectation of it, and then what kind of, what companies are able actually to implement? Is there like this, this why it sounds like there's almost this widening gap of well, I want to be able to do this, but oh, wait a sec, we can only do this. I don't think it's necessarily a widening gap, but rather, you know, David made the point that, you know, without data, you're going nowhere. Mm. Um, and, you know, the challenge really is that many companies want an AI solution without some of the foundational issues which uh, are required. And it's not just around data, it's not just around having sets of data, but uh, having data which is um, comprehensive, which is without bias, uh, which uh, is appropriate to the output which you which you are looking for from your business. So, you know, there are a number of key building points, which are key building blocks, which all link into this implementation story. So the chief exec may well say, I want an AI solution. And then the guy say, well, where do I go to? What do I do? And you think in terms of team building, you think in terms of data, you think in terms of governance, you think in terms of appropriate platforms. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day, you know, creating a data strategy uh, and, and an AI strategy uh, isn't an overnight success, but rather it's really quite a, a complex and complicated program. But uh, Tony, I, I think you're right. Uh, there's oftentimes uh, the saying, uh, how can we start uh, an AI project or let's start an AI project. I think the other way around would be much better to ask how could we do better business and uh, what is the, the market demanding, what is the world demanding, and then coming up with the answer, AI could help to do us. So as we see, Customers are always um, exceeding um, more and more um, velocity and uh, they want transparency and um, all time flexibility. And yes, AI is one of the answers to that question. But I think we should start first with how could we do better business in this world? The thing is that it's not only about basically optimizing some of your business. It's also the exploration thing. There are a lot of unknowns, unknowns that we don't know that maybe help us drive the next the next phase for the companies. And you do, you do a, a great point with uh, regarding that you need to start from a, a small things. It's, it's true. All the projects that I started at the moment are probably some in the range of six months or, or nine months at least because the technology grows so fast that it may be changed. Uh, in the UK, you have uh, Tony this uh, with, the, with the health sector, a big issue with the big data at the beginning. They spend a lot of money because they really don't, don't tackle that thing of time. I think uh, Tim's point particularly around AI being business driven is really critical. 
because I think that uh, the whole topic is becoming too important really to be left to technologists. You know, these are business issues. Um, but the real challenge is that many business leaders don't really fully understand the whole issue of AI. So there's a real knowledge, uh, a real matter of knowledge, which has to be overcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, yeah, we we have to fit all those pieces together from the business side. Um, let, let's um, almost ready to move on, but just before we do that, um, just a quick summary, Tony, Tim, and David. What do you you know? How should businesses be tackling it? Just kind of your one sentence uh, answer to to how should we be tackling this, and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, I think for me, it is focusing on the requirements of the business and finding appropriate data-driven solutions which meet those needs uh, so that you you are focused on business rather than technology and therefore you're looking through the right end of the telescope rather than the wrong end. Focus on business instead of technology. Yeah, I like that. Yes. Um, I, David. Oh, or yeah, Tom, yeah, go sorry. ahead. Sorry. No, for, for no, me, basically, just try to answer the question, are you capturing all the data that flows <clears throat> to your company? That's what the, the yeah. question that you should answer first. Are you capturing all the data that you that need? Yeah, data, business, yeah. as you pointed out, is is super critical. And if you're not collecting the right data, you don't have anything really. Yeah. And Tim, what about yourself? What? How could you summarize? This? Yeah, I wanted to add to to Tony uh, that uh, you should start uh, from the uh, the customer's point of view, and uh, not only from the business, but uh, what is the customer expecting and uh, we should um, there's a reason why big companies that are really really customer focused and centric and obsessed nearly why are so why are, uh, these companies are so successful and I think we should start there and then adopting the business and then using technology perfect excellent thank you everybody for summarizing and again, if anybody uh, who's watching would love to ask a question, please pop one in the chat uh, and we'll answer that along the way. So let's move on to uh, the next section. What does 2022 hold for AI? What's going to happen in the next month that's going to like blow everybody's minds? A lot. <laughs> and and add, add revenues to the businesses. <laughs> yes. I see a lot of uh, new upcoming uh, AI models. Like GPT-3 is uh, now around, around one, and a half, uh, one and a half years old. And now we see some more advanced models popping up and more and more. And there are some uh, European initiatives and uh, some that are really competitive in this market. And so I think uh, 2022 uh, will, yeah, will show us uh, some really new models more advanced than ever and we are we have a lot of ai startups coming up right now and uh, trying to to integrate that new ai models in their business models and uh, this is uh, quite astonishing what is happening there yeah I, i'm also building ai myself i have like close to a million lines of deep learning code developed myself and i usually, usually go to all of the main conferences or getting to the edge of the of the research in ai and it's true that now the, the the link between research and really real application is very very short and in maybe three or four months mm -hmm. so there are a lot of new things that are popping as well but i for 2022 i will summarize with just one word and that word is china because China, China is basically changing everything. All the all the things that they are developing there, and we just just see the the surface. We don't see everything that is going to happen in there. Uh, they are basically uh, having a lot of innovation going on. If you just take a look, for example, of the of the patents that they have requested, it is yeah, just skyrocketing. You basically it's like tenfold from from many other country and uh, all the countries together in the world. That's not the, the the amount of patents that are really really granted at the end, but the amount of the, the ones that they sent is huge. So basically, there is a boom of innovation in China that we need really to see what's going to, to be. And I think this is the work for this year. But I think it's not just China right? either, David. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of movement happening happening in India. Yeah. And one of the particular issues of both those countries are really matters of scale, insofar as that uh, in the UK or in Europe, you know, we tend to think perhaps of running a pilot with maybe 30,000 users in the pilot as a proof of concept. Um, I was fortunate to go out to Beijing you know, maybe three years ago now and spoke with the regulators there. And they were talking in terms of 30,000 new users per day in a pilot. So in, in terms of them bringing new ideas to market, uh, their ability to uh, operate at a much larger scale and obtain all the scale efficiencies are 
is is very different to to the Western market. So you know, I think you're right around around the China India thing. Um, to Tim's point around um, startups, um, I'm seeing in this year uh, a lot more activity from venture capitalists. Um, it feels like over the past two years, they've kind of been a little nervous about what's been going on. Uh, and all of a sudden, um, you know, we're now hitting this point where they feel as if they've got to take action. And therefore, there's a lot of investment happening, a lot of money coming into the system. Um, but of course, the real question, maybe the thousand dollar question is, um, you know, COVID hasn't gone away, the pandemic hasn't gone away. So therefore, will the nervousness still exist? And also, of course, the, the elephant in the corner, the Ukrainian situation, will that also reduce the appetite of investors to put money into into startups and, and AI tech companies? So it, it, for me, 2022 remains interesting and uncertain. But you've got to remember, we're actually two thirds, we're one third of our way through the year. You know, we we really need to be thinking more about 2023 at the moment. Yeah. So what's what's going to stick though? So if we had this conversation New Year's Eve, <laughs> 2022, uh, in nine months or eight eight and a half months, whatever from now, what would we be talking about? Like what's stuck around? You guys think um, that that's really kind of sticky for businesses to say, oh yes, I need to do this. It's not just some cutesy little app. It's not just some kind of simple analytics it's 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 profound are we going to see profound this year yeah i think um uh, the businesses that does not start a pro uh, that have not started a project until <laughs> new year's eve uh in a project um will uh, stay behind and uh, this will be uh, the big point and um i want to, to add uh, another point to, to what uh, tony said um we see a lot of activity also at the intersection between AI and uh, biotechnology. Yes, COVID is still uh, a topic mm -hmm. in our days, and maybe it will be a stay uh, a topic until the end of the year. But we also see some AI startups um, dealing with solutions in that um, direction where on this uh, set intersection between AI and biotechnology. Yes, I'm wondering whether you know, one of the big issues for 2022 for many companies is one of survival. You know, obviously, kind of customer is, is important and the rest. But, you know, what do com companies have to do to um, remain trading? Uh, and maybe cust maybe growth isn't necessarily the test any longer. Uh, maybe it's how they reduce their, their costs, how they uh, use analytics and AI to obtain operational efficiency. And also with the very volatile nature of their assets, you know, how are they going to manage their risk in a better sort of way? I think, again, risk tech will become more prevalent going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree that risk is going to be fundamental. We are just in an, in a, we don't know where the war is going to go to end in this, and this is going to change a lot of things. As of course, inflation is going to be rising, and that is going to mean that competitiveness is going to be critical for the companies. And some of them are going to stay, and many of them probably are going to fail. So with this uh, reduction of companies in some sense, because not everyone is going to be able to compete, I think will be a, an interesting scenario from this business standpoint. And from the technology standpoint for 2022, I think the main areas of development will be still in all regarding, regarding to NLP, to natural language processing, and use it for anything in, in, in a web corporation. Of course, all regarding to computer vision too. And I will see also a rise of use in, in IoT, in using devices and capturing data from different kinds of sensors for many, I don't know, for, for many companies that are, for example, have uh, tracks or how, whatever it is uh, going around the world and using that kind of data to, to start to gather, uh, not, not to gather it, but to start to taking decisions from it. But I wonder also whether, you know, because of all those stresses, we might start seeing more consolidation within the industry, not just the tech industry, but also amongst the, the client base where you're seeing large companies um, effectively sharing their, their cost base and maybe their technology platforms. Uh, and therefore that consolidation could well be a trend for for later into 2022 and, and 2023. Excellent. Um, but wh what what do we actually need to like adopt some of these things? So can we be specific? 
Um, and you know, if, if businesses are trying to adopt something, how, how should they jump in for 2022? So if they could set like a next nine month plan, what, what should they do? And, and can we name names? Can we say you should do this type of application as well? If you can. No, I think, oh, sorry. no, no, starting with, with RPA, I think that's it's one of the low hanging fruits that you can start using. And there are many, many things that you can do from, I don't know, from the one from Robocorp, you can use the, the one from Microsoft and many others. So if you start with RPA, it's one of the low hanging fruits that will, will help your business in the short run. Yeah, this is definitely a good idea. And sales automation as well. Uh, the systems are in marketing automation. You can use them uh, as they are and just plug and play. And uh, yeah, there are no um, big projects behind it. And so, yes, they are definitely low hanging fruit as well. I guess, like any um, project or program, you know, it all starts with leadership and sponsorship. Um, and if you have that support from the top, then that helps ease all the political problems and, and operational issues in any transformation. I think, like you say, uh, there are technologies which you can pretty well buy off the shelf and get up and running very quickly. Um, and therefore, the um, the speed to delivery becomes much shorter. Um, the interesting thing there, of course, is, you know, many people always still say, you know, how do I really calculate the return on investment? You know, show me the money, the old Jerry Maguire story. And it's almost as if you have to go back to uh, BI basics, business intelligence basics, to have effective financial performance management so you can actually truly measure the improvement. Because, of course, you know, no matter how strong you are as a sponsor uh, or a leader, uh, if you are not able to show the business advantage to the remaining stakeholders, they'll simply just throw it out the door. Um, that's, that's fundamental in any, in any project. But you know, almost going going back to basics, the ability to show an effective ROI. Unless, of course, you say it's not really about hard benefit; it's about soft benefit. But that's a different story. Yeah, I think. Well, I guess it makes a example, difference if you. Yeah. yeah no, regarding ahead, that, David. for example, in my last book, Automate or Be Automated, I explore a formula where you can try to see the things that you repeat, and from then try to see what are the most valuable for your company. Because at the end, if you understand that time is the one of the more critical assets for any corporations, and time can be the, the time that you use for anything, or even even the, the time of machines to do things, not, not only humans, and you see what things you are repeating and you can try to automate them, you are going to win a lot of raw in that there. Yes, I like that a lot, uh, a lot in your uh, newest book, David. And uh, this is um, totally right. Uh, you can make money, but you can't make time. Yeah. 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 No, for sure. So, so is there um, um, something to say with you know the big hit for twenty twenty two is going to be a certain software? Like, should we be doing it ourselves or? developing something specific for ourselves or should we try to get something off the shelf well it's always the old argument isn't it build or buy yeah um, because i mean that affects business roi yeah, yeah, if we yeah. want to develop it or if we can get something obviously not completely off the shelf but you know, you know what i mean partially or something to kind of get us going as well i, I want to kind of find those those kickstarters to say hey you can you can do this just start here and i love the idea so far but just curious should we be focusing on off the shelf technology or developing something it's not, it's uh, not that difficult but it's definitely a good idea to ask some experts like the keen folks or uh, mm -hmm. for instance um as it is not complicated but yes of course you can like an old technology you can uh, sometimes you need some time as trial and error if you're doing it on your own even if the software is out of the shelf yeah, I agree that you need to find the right partners to help you because it's difficult for you to know at the beginning everything. So you, you find you need to find that. But I think it's a mix. You can use of the cell for many things, but if you really want to explore the, the, the real capabilities of your own corporations, you need to build your own stuff. And for that, you need to create, start creating these teams, gather the right uh, helpers to, to go through, through that process. And it is a mix because the sooner you start also with building things by, by your own, the more capability you're going to be able to to use it because the data that you have probably is unique if you re are really a unique company your data is unique so your solutions also should be i think the the issue about implementation um if you go to a third party to help with that uh speed to market or speed to delivery uh, it really reinforces the fact that you need a very objective assessment of those third parties i think often there's a danger that 
you know, we, we look at capabilities through rose tinted glasses. Um, and we sometimes really need informed organizations to step back and do an appropriate due diligence and not really be lured by marketing or, or fancy sites or whatever, uh, or even case studies which aren't really appropriate to your own business, but rather the need to have a third party who can very sensibly and impartially offer you advice. I think it's really critical. So, so don't yeah. fall in love with it. Is that what you're saying, Tony? Well, of course. I think the danger also is that if you build it yourself, if if <laughs> if if Fred builds it himself and then leaves, you know, most of the time you don't actually know what the guy's done, and uh, <laughs> you'll only have to recruit him again as a consultant later on to to untangle the mess. So, uh, you know, there are pros and cons. Um, you know, often I see organisations which uh, purchase software and then migrate it in and, and customise it. So there were different approaches. Yes, I've seen it a lot uh, also uh, in the late you know, 80s, 90s, installing some uh, business intelligence in, uh, software on their own. And now uh, all the uh, engineers are retiring and nobody can run it anymore. Of course. Of course. <laughs> yeah, the world may change, but the end is, is the same. Yeah. These yeah. are a lot of trends that are also probably merging at some point or, or mixing. Uh, of course, we have the Web3, we have the metaverse and so on. And probably the, the mix with using AI or automation in with all of these uh, other things is going to be a mix, inter interesting mix to explore, but not to be fully driving with this hype of the things that are trendy only. I think also That's just as a, as a side issue, um, the the issue of cybersecurity is, is really big. I wasn't sure whether we were going to cover it today, but you know it's just becoming a, a real monster for, for all industries and all sectors. Mm -hmm. And I think the real danger is that when we build capabilities ourselves, we have to ensure that that security is adequately built into a system. At least the advantage of going to a third party is that uh, normally they will have done some sort of work in that space or, and you can audit it. And if it goes terribly wrong, there are contractual obligations perhaps between the two of you. Uh, but, you know, the elephant in the corner again is the challenge and the, the very real threat of, of cyber security, cyber, cyber risk. Yeah, no, definitely. And that's, that's one of the, the places that we want to go to next is putting on your, your um, crystal ball reading glasses and your hat and all that sort of thing. So cyber security is obviously um, important. What other top trends in AI, you know, will we see in the next five years? Um, are we going to see a, a situation like, uh, what was that movie? Ex Machina, Ex Machina, mm -hmm. where Ex he Machina. develops the, the, um, <laughs> the autistic we, we have, savant, we which guy be develops. There. Yeah. No, I think no. we won't, we won't be an Ex Machina yet, but for me, the, the, <laughs> the three words are robotics, robotics and robotics, because so far I think everything is about digital things, but we need to move to the, to the real world and to the, this physical thing. And for that, if we think that now we have close to 5 million industrial robots in the world, that's just very few. And we probably will, will we will even surpass the number of humans uh, in probably in these five years. It will happen the same with, uh, with IoT, that we have no more devices connected than humans on planet oh, wow. Earth. I think the same will should and should happen with AI because AI, if you just use the digital power of, of AI and automation, is going to be quite limited. But if you explore it with the things in the world, it's going to change a lot. And of course, everything that is Tesla is doing with the new board and many other things that are being in that space is going to be fundamental. But you need to be very careful because multiplying bits is quite easy, but multiplying hardware is not so. And there is a, a huge obsolescence with the hardware. But if you will, if you are able to reduce enough the cost and have enough good capabilities to use it, it's going to be a game changer. I think we will see two main uh, developments in this area. As you said, David, yes, uh, there will be uh, robotics, but uh, I think they will be uh, voice driven. So we will have voice bots are developing at a, at a tremendous pace. And so we will see robots at work in our offices, which we can command where, uh, with voices. And this will be a lot of, uh, that will, this will be a lot easier. So um, you can, uh, as a coworker or as a, as a leader, you can, um, you can direct uh, these uh, these bots with your voice and tell them what to do. And on the other hand, I think uh, the other part uh, will be that we see um, uh, forecasts in, in scenarios. Uh, as we see right now, uh, there are strong uh, developments, scenarios in the building sector, and this will also 
to the finance sector, for instance, and for um, governance in uh, in businesses as well. We will have uh, the chance to um, to build a whole scenario. For instance, uh, tell the machine what would happen to our business if we had another pandemic with another virus next year. And so uh, we um, this will um, this will give us a very very clear image of the future that might be uh, if we um, change some uh, some parameters. Yeah, yeah, regarding that, I will add just one thing. It's true that voice is fundamental. It is growing a lot, and it's basically one of the key developments of deep learning over the last maybe six years or so. Mm -hmm. But over the next ones, it probably is going to be a lot of impact in neurotechnologies. My own, my own company, my big data, we are just exploring that for the last six years. We are creating algorithms and gathering brain signals to do that. And probably is going to be a game changer in the future. Now, for example, the Taikonauts, Taikonauts are the, the Chinese astronauts mm -hmm. in the space stations. They are already controlling robots using only their mind without any other device. And they are doing much better than if you just use a joystick or use whatever other kind of human uh, computer interaction device. So brain computer, basically using brain computer interfaces to interact with technology is going to be changing over the last other the next years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's really interesting what you're saying, guys, but it feels a little to me like a a technology view of the world. And I'd like to kind of yeah. come back to Tim's point where, <laughs> and I think, I think the, the real driver here is business. And, <laughs> I, and I think that in the next five years, I think what we will particularly see, a couple of trends, um, what we'll particularly see is a move to a much more informed uh, f type of leadership. I think leaders will have become much more comfortable with the, the concepts and the technologies and the, the, potential to use new business models. Uh, so therefore, I think we'll go through a major change in five years around how our leadership behaves. I think the second thing also linking back into what Tim mentioned earlier was the um, ease at which AI and capabilities will be used by the business. You know, AI as a service, I think will become predominant and therefore that will become one of the key enablers, I think, just in terms of uh, how quickly one can um, develop new capabilities and, and open up new markets and, and new products. And I think the third one, a really critical one, is that um, we will figure out how to avoid bias. I think, again, coming back to David's point around uh, the challenge of data and obtaining the right data and managing it, I think that many sectors, uh, many industries, many functions inherently uh, use data which has either a conscious or unconscious bias. Uh, and I think that within five years, we will have figured out a way to have uh, removed bias so that we can have a much more sensible and balanced decision around some of the automation and robotics which we use. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with it. you. I think that, of course, bias and security and all of that is critical. And of course, if we if you involve management, and even if you why not automate management, is another critical way to go. I just a few years ago I coined the term MCO or by machine CEO, and I don't know if in five years we're going to be able to have that. But it's true that we are starting to see machines in in work like basically interacting like like a board member in the context where that is possible because some other areas is this is not legal. But basically, starting not just being uh, assisting decisions in the board, but also being a new a new a new member, and I think we will will be a lot of more in that space. So far, we have seen it mostly in the VC space, in the venture capital, and so on. They already have the first one was in 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 South Korea to implement one, but probably this uh, moving this kind of automated decision systems, but as as a new member, I think it's going to be one of the trends to see. Yeah, and this will be a um, really challenge uh, for leadership as well, to how to deal with um, with co-leaders uh, being an AI. Yes, you're right. And Salesforce has uh, many experiences with uh, AI as a board member. And uh, there are some problems involved on, on the human level, of course. Yeah. I wonder whether within five years we'll have reached a sort of tipping point. Uh, you know, whereupon nowadays we think in terms of, you know, why should we use AI and you know, what will we do with it? Whereupon in five years' time, people will be saying, why aren't we using AI? Maybe the, the discussion um, and the pendulum will have swung to a different place. You know, imagine the board meeting uh, and the guy saying, well, you know, why aren't we using AI? All our competitors are doing it. Uh, you almost are falling into a me too strategy. Uh, mm. And that would be quite a, quite a shift in thinking um, 
and of course that opens up many 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 doors yeah and that so, would have been uh, another good question for the title of our webinar no? why business should not <laughs> need to adopt <laughs> yeah. I think at the end, it's, it's a matter of competitiveness. Of course, there is a lot of regulations that may, trade, may try to stop the advancement of AI automation or whatever, but at the end, it's competitiveness. I remember I just giving a, a keynote lecture 20, 25 years ago, 20, 24 years ago, and, and I was talking about the, the issue of what, what are, in the case of South Korea, for example, doing uh, 24 years ago. And basically, they are starting to, to implement technology, what we, call, no, we, we now call digital, basically in the core of the country itself. And people get horrorized by, by seeing the child's with two or three years expending like eight or 10 hours using using the digital devices. And they were basically all right. You just, just can see the GDP, for example, of South Korea over the past 20 years, what happened. But yet to David's point, um, I don't think we can disassociate progress from government intervention. I think the companies which we've mentioned like Korea and China and others are very heavily supported uh, in terms of um, funding and, and taxation relief. Uh, to develop new technologies. Yeah. So, you know, these aren't necessarily just tech driven initiatives, but rather, you know, government driven as well. Yeah, like Singapore and other countries in yeah. this area. What do you... How do we actually get more, more sales here? I mean, that was one of the points we talked at earlier. Um, how can we use AI to, to improve the business bottom, bottom line, not just measure things and, you know, obviously help make decisions and that sort of thing, but can we use AI for marketing? and for selling more of our services and products and that sort of thing. And how do we do that? In, in two ways, I think, and, and uh, yeah, two main ways. Uh, one thing is customers demand uh, velocity. Uh, we have to be the fast as we, uh, we the fastest we can. And so uh, what um, Tony mentioned, predictive analytics, predictive selling, and um, some AI, um, yeah, predicting what our customer is going to want tomorrow and showing him this tomorrow morning uh, will be the fastest way <laughs> we could do to uh, to offer uh, to make the offer. And uh, the other way around is um, the other the other point is um, convenience. Uh, our customers, B two B and B two C customers, love convenience and uh, they don't want um, uh, heavy processes. They want a, a sleek process. And uh, there's AI uh, a key element to offer this. Yeah, I think to that point as well, remember that the customer no longer compares one retailer against another, but rather compares a retailer against maybe a best of breed bank or insurance company. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the platform has changed and the game has changed. Um, and I think that also opens the door to new distribution channels as well. The idea that financial services can become um, retailers, that retailers can, can sell uh, telco solutions uh, can sell groceries. You know, I think I think there are some interesting game changes likely to happen, but it links again to what Tim was saying about the idea of anticipating customer need, but also, you know, even going further back into that and, and saying, if I can anticipate customer need, then I can drill that into the supply chain as well. And therefore I can start um, supplying things or building things or whatever in a much more efficient almost just in time approach you know my wife ordered a cooker um six months ago and it took you know the best part of five months for this damn thing to arrive uh, and the argument was well you know kind of supply chain and you know we can't get the bits and, and this that and the other um you know, it's only because of her delight in 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 uh spending time you know cooking for the family that she was patient but that's not a that's not an appropriate solution for the 22nd century. Yeah, I think we, we, we I totally agree. I think we need we have a lot of things to sell because really business to consumer is just a scratching the surface of what is possible. And for that, maybe these delivery robots are going to help a lot because at, at the moment, the, the limit is basically how you how you are able not only to build, but also to, de to deliver. And that could change a lot with that. Of course, we are starting to have this, uh, the emergence of this, what now it's called the, instead of basically the internet of, of everything, but basically we are talking about the matter net, the things that really you are able to, to transfer matter, transfer products, transfer services between different locations. And we are starting to see what Amazon is just starting to do in some specific uh, just test bed at the moment, that they have this predictive uh, scent of any product. So basically before you even think you want to have this product, they are going to send it to you. So basically you have this aha moment and probably that could so explode in the following years. 
So, yeah, but, so um, could we get rid of could we get rid of marketing then? <laughs> Go team, your worst. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm sorry, but Amazon is closing this service now because they are not successful with it. Yeah. Oh, I think I think the reality is that marketing has changed as a function. You know, we no longer think of it in terms of the guy who's able to, or a woman who's able to create a, a fancy advertisement or whatever, or a strategy. You know, our, our best marketers are marketers who have technological capability, who can understand the whole digital environment uh, and to and to tap into the customer in a much more informed way than they've ever done before. But what we're actually seeing again is kind of a, like marketing, a whole number of hybrid professions emerging. You know, the hybrid marketer, the hybrid financial controller, the hybrid sales guy who, who works, who is the face of uh, the organization, but the, the actual heavy lifting is done by technology. Uh, but yet the customer ultimately just wants that human interaction. Uh, yeah. The education will go through that change as well, um, where teachers will become technologists. Um, we're certainly seeing that in, in the medical profession as well. Uh, so there's a whole lot of change, not only in industry, but also in professions. It's a really interesting time to be in the game. Yeah. And this right. is this going to be game changer again because automation for marketing can change everything because you're starting to go directly to really personalize all the experience. And from that, you will be able to sell more and to sell better. Yeah, yeah but what, what I'm seeing though, David, also is that I'm seeing many organizations, universities, for example, and professional organizations who teach a profession and then add a little bit of technology on at the end. Um, and I think the penny hasn't entirely dropped that technology is absolutely uh, integral to the future. So therefore, marketing and technology aren't separate professions, but they are integrated capabilities. Um, so therefore, you know, there's going to be a whole lot of change in terms of the pe way people are trained and, and, um, and gain experience. Yeah, but this will happen in all business units, won't it? Yeah. And and uh, and people in relations and in finance as well. We see this HR, everyone. Yeah, yeah, HR. Yes, I have a question to you guys. Uh, my personal theory is uh, that we are looking in, in the next ten years that uh, through uh, concepts like AI as a service and robotics in in all business units, uh, won't it happen that all businesses globally have the same uh, chances to compete. So uh, now um, competitiveness is out of um, better access to supply chain or better innovation or uh, better access to, uh, to talents or whatever it may be. And all that will be leveled out and uh, all companies will have the same chances to compete. And so what will happen next? What will be the com uh, where will be where will the competitive advantages come from but if you don't have the same data data will be the the key here because if you have like different data than your competitors it's going to be key okay but maybe the argument against that david could be that the emergence of synthetic data mm -hmm. may provide a leveling capability to the smaller organizations uh, i think brand will remain important you know i think the customer remains quite fickle in terms of brand yeah. But, the, but the reality is that um, the way that brand is put before a customer can also be done in an informed AI way as well. Yeah. Uh, sort of placement, of course. Yeah, we, we, we see this. That's, okay. Yeah. yeah I but think we, we saw yeah. the data, I think, is, is again the fundamental area. I, I agree also with you, Tony, with this augmentation of data is fundamental now. We use it a lot. But for example, why, for example, now the metaverse has so, so much hype? Because at the end, the smartphone is dying. Why is dying? Because basically, it wasn't able to capture enough data, enough data of you doing things. But if you are in the right. metaverse with VR devices, right. with, with, with headsets, a lot of data, a lot of more data can be captured of the things that you do to when you interact with, with, your, with your brand or whatever. So that data is going to be leveraged to learn more about you and to sell you better and to create better products for you. Okay. Yeah, to give you better choices as well. You can use that data if properly, if used properly to help you in the selling and help you in the predictive uh, selling and that sort of thing as well. All right, so maybe we could um, summarize here out of, we've talked about a lot, but what would be your one final, you know, um, uh, trend that you see happening in the next five or even 10 years? So what, what's your top one? 
uh, for me, more, uh, more uh, insightful leadership. And um, that's probably it. The, the leadership issue will tra be transformed. So having leaders that know that they need to be able to use AI properly kind of thing. Well, not necessarily physically used, but to understand the capabilities. And the right. That, and the fact that it, it can be used to change business models as well yeah. as uh, operational issues. Okay. For All me, right. leadership yourself, in Tim? robotics. Yeah. Oh, David? For me, it's leadership in robotics, yeah. Leadership in robotics. So we got two for leadership, <laughs> Tim. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I have a technology, a technological one. I think uh, AI programming, AI itself, will be uh, at the point for the next five to ten years. And we see this um, codeless uh, projects, and it will gain um, some more speed. And so, yes, AI programming itself and um, improving itself. Excellent. All right, cool. So let's um, let's move on to the, the Q&A. Thank you so much, Tony and Tim and David. If there are any questions out there, um, please let's uh, put them into the chat and we'll try to address them uh, in the next couple of minutes that we have um, our expert panel with us. So, all right. Okay. From Wajdi Gorski, um, probably don't have that name correctly, but Welcome, thank you, Washti. Uh, more of a metaverse-focused question than directly AI, but how do you think the metaverse will look alike look like once we move past the shiny, um, shiny world-like creations and we move on to something completely new? How big a role does blockchain technology play in all of that? Uh, Would like to take a stab at that one. So I'll more of the metaverse type of thing. I'll I'll first. I would like to, to answer this one uh, because uh, this is uh, totally sales related. We see virtual sales right now and uh, virtual objects and uh, sneakers or uh, uh, Gucci bags and so on are a big hype right now. And blockchain is the, the basis of this. And I think, uh, yes, and uh, buying uh, terrains and um, uh, real estate in the metaverse will uh, will it be a big issue in the next um, years to come thanks tim anybody else want to take on yeah maybe i'll pick up pick up on this one see i i'm a little concerned about metaverse because i think that metaverse along with another a number of other technologies uh, are being thrown out there as being a picture of the this wonderful future um but yet you know we've yet to really understand what it's all about and what the capabilities are um, one of my favorite bits of information is the, uh, the Gartner, I think Gartner hype cycle, <laughs> which identifies, you know, what's kind of likely to be hot and when it will materialize, uh, and will it just kind of be, uh, disillusionment at the end. So I've yet to be a little bit convinced by, by metaverse. Um, I think blockchain is an entirely different issue. Um, I think blockchain will become intrinsic to, uh, almost all our commercial relationships, both B2B and B2C. Uh, I think that um, as we increasingly move to digital cash, I think it will become one of the, the main ways that uh, governments control taxation and various other ways. So I think metaverse and blockchain are different. Uh, I think blockchain will uh, progress much more quickly than uh than metaverse. yeah for me yeah, metaverse is, like it's all, it's all about yeah for me metaverse is all about technology and i have i created one of the first companies that i created in 1995 was about virtual reality and i just recovered one of the first tv interviews that they made me in 1998 about virtual reality and you see the things that i did then and you see the world that they that we created then and you see many of the worlds of the metaverse that they are creating today and the technology is even better 24 years ago than what we have now in, in some regards because there's a lot of hype there. And at the end, I think that is technology because when you want to create, when you want to do something virtual, you want to recreate the senses. And we don't have yet the technology even to get a fraction of what is possible with our senses. The bandwidth that we have in our eyes, in all of our senses, and the things that we can perceive in, in the world, in the physical world, we don't have yet the technology to replicate that fully on, on, on a metaverse or on, on any digital technology. So basically, you are looking at the zipped version and a smaller, much smaller version of the things that you can, you can of course, do in the, in the real world. Of course, you can do other things that you cannot do in the physical in the world. You are not constrained by, by all the things that we have in the physical laws and many other things. But it is, it's an interesting topic to see how it develops. Now, the technology is a bit better, but I think there's a long way to go. And of course, yeah, blockchain can, can do a lot of things here. 
too. Yeah, there's definitely a lot that we need to look at in terms of applicability for businesses. And I don't think businesses are ready. Obviously, there's some businesses being conducted um, in the metaverse. But I think the, from the practical application, it's still a ways off, at least for the majority of, of um, B2B and B2C type businesses. There are, there are obviously going to be kind of those fringe businesses that are able to do that, like selling NFTs on the metaverse. <laughs> yeah, <that's it. laughs> so so i mean it's interesting that metaverse really is a convergence of ai and gaming really yeah. um, and uh, maybe the future will be around very clever convergences of technology and effectively putting one on one together and making three or four uh so yeah. you know that could be an interesting development too yeah and we don't have to right, remember so. that to, to, to forget that for example gaming is basically what, what have changed the world because the technology that we have today the computing capabilities growth thanks to games so yeah yeah excellent thanks david thanks wadi for the uh the question uh let's move on to the next one from nicole do you think data privacy will have a crucial role in the metaverse so back to the metaverse and uh, maybe let's expand that out too is like will data privacy have a crucial role in ai and and the future as well oh data privacy gosh that's a big big issue um <laughs> you know i think i think the starting point for this answer for me would be uh the matter the issue of devices as we move into a 5g and 6g environment so we're going to end up with this massive proliferation of devices with much larger amounts of data than we've ever had before and the need for technology to help us organize that data and find insight but by the same measure same measure the number of devices we have just create more points of potential entry for cybercrime so um you know data privacy will become one of the one of the will remain one of the key issues it could even be one of the differentiators going back to an earlier conversation you know what will what will differentiate one bank from another or one organization from another or well, maybe their ability to look after my data uh, because if i don't trust them with my data why would i trust them with my money yes or one country with the other if some country you can use whatever data that you want in another country you can't that can be also interesting thing to to see yeah also i think data ownership is fundamental because it's not yet about privacy but if you you don't own the data that you produce and you don't you have no no really leverage to the things that you do there in basically if everything is free we know what happened no? yeah that's... You're, you're the product <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's an important point Excellent. Anything else anybody wants to add to that one? No? Cool. Thanks, Nicole, for the question. Alvaro, uh, what role will play will AI play in K-12 education? How do we get rid of a possible AI divide? Great question. So, yeah, is there going to be that separation between the haves and the have-nots? Yes, we see this a lot. Uh, the, the, the digital divide is a, is a really uh, great upcoming uh, problem we have. And uh, not uh, only in terms of AI, but in terms of digitality, digitality uh, in, as a whole. And um, we should focus on this. And uh, But uh, I personally um, have the hope that uh, with a new... Um, upcoming and, and, and on new uh, teachers from the universities going to the schools uh, this will mm -hmm. um, the, the problem is often mm -hmm. I think we are we are probably some critical point in time because the capacity of AI the capacity of machines is going to grow exponentially with probably 10 or 15 years and the, the the students that we have now are going to be the last teachers of machines. And if they are not basically in the right moving with the right experience to do it, it's going to be critical and it's going to be something to, to have in mind. I think the AI divide also um, is a problem in terms of data bias, because those with AI capability and, and able to get on the, um, able to provide data, obviously that data set then skews the, the entire data reservoir. Um, so therefore, we have this challenge that those who are marginalized or excluded um, have to find a way of being represented within that data set. Otherwise, the, the overall data will always fail to recognize their existence. Even. It'll have that yeah. bias yeah, built in. Yeah. Who you yeah, are won't, won't be represented in the new AIs. And if we go to the next level of AI, probably this uh, big level of AI, you won't be there. But of course, some people, 
choose to opt out of AI and choose to opt out of data. Um, and they're perfectly entitled to. Um, I guess a question for me is that in this new world going forward, which is data infused, do we treat people who have opted out in a different way to the ones who have willingly contributed? Can you opt out to use a fire, for example? Well, who knows? You know, for example, That's, my, my yeah. kids, you know, they will, they're quite happy to opt into sharing data with, with um, a coffee bar if they get, uh, you know, 5% off their, their latte, the, yeah. the bill of, for the latte. Yeah. But Tony, the, the problem is if you opt out, uh, your possibilities and your opportunities um, um, could come close to zero. And uh, you will have a problem if you if you opt out. It's like uh, not being vaccinated con uh, against Corona these days. Yeah, Would and it's going to be more challenging because I think over the every ten or fifteen years we will need to decide if you're going to be human augmented humans or not. Because now the technology is starting starting to be not just wearable devices but implantable devices, and that fix that that fix between technology and computers and humans and, and technology. Is going to be a critical one, and probably we will need to decide in maybe in 15 years if we want to if we want to be classic humans or augmented humans, and that's going to be a game changer too. But that makes imagine me smarter. in 25 years having four, three guys like you, four guys of us together, having four <laughs> computers having a conversation like this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Have you guys seen Severance, that that TV show on Apple Apple Plus? <laughs> Which one? It's, it's called Severance. Severance. Where they inject some kind of AI that allows them to switch between job person and home person. <laughs> Are we going to be there? <laughs> okay. It's something uh, like a digital twin uh, that's going to work kind of, but they're, they're separated. Like they go yeah. through the lift in the morning to work and they don't remember anything from being a person at their home. And then they <laughs> leave work and they go home and they don't remember anything from work. So it's like this AI switch that kind of, plays with their brain are we going to have yeah, that just split brain no <laughs> i don't think it will be i don't think so yeah okay all right that that, that, that makes it a lot easier to watch then <laughs> all right cool so let's thank you everybody for the questions let's quickly just give a quick summary tony what did you learn tim what did you learn david what did you learn and then we'll uh, close it off um i learned never to stop listening uh i think that people have different views um it's an area that we are all stakeholders in you know, the reality is that, you know, we are either going to be contributing to this new world or be a recipient or some might say a victim of it. Uh, but whatever position we take, we are entitled to a point of view and that we should always exercise that point of view whenever possible. Yeah, I learned that, of course, you need to have in mind risk. You have you need to have in mind data privacy. You need to have in mind sales. You need to have in mind marketing and you need to mix all this together with this AI. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, David and Tim. I learned that data is key. Okay. Data is key. <laughs> and yeah, data yeah, yeah. Is key and uh, <laughs> yes, we have, you know, which data and data owners. And uh, yes, we have to no. uh, deal a lot with uh, data issues. Yeah, fantastic. And I le learned that there's um, three other gentlemen that are much smarter than I. So thank you, gentlemen, for increasing the, my knowledge about all these great topics. So thanks, Tony. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, David. Uh, for all those who watch, really appreciate it. Thanks, Mariana, as well in the background, who's been changing the slides and getting us coordinated. Uh, and like, obviously, I can tell like hurting cats at times. So <laughs> thank you, Mariana, for doing that. Thanks, keen folks as well for supporting this. I guess, actually, do you have the link maybe, Mariana, you can put in to, to um, uh, download the report if you've got it? Uh, if not, uh, Tony, how do we connect with you? Tim, how do we connect with you? David, if you want to throw a link in the chat, feel free to. Yeah. Or just tell us where we can connect with you as well. Yeah, you, you'll find me on LinkedIn, Tim Cortinovis, and uh, I'll be there. I, 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 I hang around there uh, oftentimes. And so, yes, let us uh, meet and chat on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah, there's only one Tony Bubier in the world. So uh, <laughs> you'll find him fairly easily on LinkedIn too. <laughs> Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah and there's you, only Doyle. one Doyle Bueller as well. So, <laughs> yeah. well thank you, Doyle, for the most charming uh, moderation of this webinar. And uh, thank you, Keen folks, for having me here. Thanks a lot. Yes, thank you. my pleasure. And um, yeah, no, it was it was really fun. So thanks very much. And Marianne actually posted the link to the report, The Bridge the Digital Gap for 2021. So if you haven't seen it, please download it. It's a fantastic analysis. And we get a 
hear more from all of us uh, within the the document as well. So it's some some great things to learn and see and refresh your memory and uh, point you hopefully point you in the right direction as well. So again, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, everybody have a wonderful day, and we will see you guys online next time. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you very much. Very great bye to be bye. here today. Bye bye. Bye.